original super fun and all about artisan cheese and more to melt your peaceful heart and toast your peaceful life. Coming to you from the Appalachian Mountains of southwestern Virginia, this is the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hey, this is Scott Hall from Peaceful Heart Farm, and you are listening to the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hello, everybody. Melanie Hall here. I hope you're doing well. The conversation today and every day revolves around the value of tradition, traditional food prep and storage, traditional cooking, and of course, traditional artisan cheese. Topics discussed here are designed to create new perspectives and possibilities for how you might add the taste of tradition to your life. This week's topic brings back memories of days gone by, and it just might stir up the desire in you to cook over an open fire. Well, maybe not you. Maybe someone you know. In any case, I thank you all for listening, and I hope you find this information useful. Thank you. Thank you so much to all you veteran homestead-loving regulars, and welcome to all of you new listeners out there. Let me know what you're interested in. And I'll see if I can come up with some compelling dialogue. In today's show, of course, we're going to get the usual homestead life updates. There's a lot going on. It's spring. And um, then today's topic is cooking on the hearth. And our recipe for today is mint sauce. It's fabulous with lamb roast. So let's get on with the homestead life updates. Now, Let's start with the cows. Um, Our newest addition, her name is Butter, and she had her calf. We don't have a name yet. Uh, So if you've got suggestions, just, you know, hop over to the website, to this podcast, jump down in the comments and give us a suggestion there. Uh, Butter is a purebred jersey, and she has certified A2A2 genetics. Now, if you're not familiar with what that means... I will do a podcast on that at a later time, but just a summary, the health benefits of raw milk from cows with A2A2 genetics are substantial. So she's going to be a a focus point of our herd share program. Uh, So we have four calves now, and there are two more still to come. Butter's calf is, she's so, she's so pretty. She's so cute. You can see pictures of her uh, at our, uh, on our Facebook page. Uh, And you can just search for Peaceful Heart Farm, all one word, Peaceful Heart Farm. And uh, like our page and you'll get updates on that as well. So the sheep, let's talk about the sheep. Finally, the last ewe had her lambs. She has a lovely set of twins. She twins just about every year, and she's really good at raising them. So that brings our total lambs this season to nine. All are alive and well, every single one of them. Only one issue, uh, but Lambert is doing well on his bottle. Every morning and afternoon, I go out and I call, Lambikins, and he comes running. And as soon as he's finished, it's so funny, he finishes his bottle, and then he just stops and he'll look kind of look around and then he'll just turn around and he'll trot back to his mom and his two siblings it's it's such a funny thing because he knows he's bonded to his mom but he knows he has to come to me for his food but that's all he he gets his food and then he, he leaves he kind of ignores me so it's it's really it's comical now let me give you an update on the quail so we've we've had these uh quail eggs in the incubator now for a while and they've hatched we have 24 baby quail in a brooder right now um you know they peeped a lot when they first hatched but now they're really as quiet as church mice they eat a lot too i have spent lots of time just watching them running around pecking here and there in just a short three weeks time they will be fully feathered three weeks and they'll be ready to move out to their quail condo scott's working on that right now as we speak by eight weeks the hens will be laying eggs and then i'll start the process all over again until we have the number of birds we want for breeding stock our goal is to raise all of the eggs that we eat and eggs and coffee are just about the only items that I currently buy from the grocery store. 
so that's soon to be only coffee. We can't grow coffee here. Let me talk about the steers. We have three steers that are soon to be up for grabs. If you're interested in a quarter, a half, or even a whole steer, please get on the list quickly. Uh, the first one will go to processing maybe late June and will be available for pickup around mid-July. We are always, always, always limited in the uh, amount of grass-fed beef that we have available. Uh, again, please get on the list early. Just hop over to www.peacefulheartfarm.com, go to the contact page, drop me a note, and let me know that you're interested in that, and I'll make contact with you, and we'll see uh, what we can do, how we, how we can help you with that. As far as the garden goes, the tomatoes are in. I think I had 60 plus tomato plants that I put in. It was it was a bigger job than I thought it was going to be. But um, I persevered and I got them all in the ground. So a lot, the dried beans are up. I still need to plant the green beans. I've got um, two 24 or 21 square foot areas for beans. And then we also got in the potato slips yesterday. So... Uh, once those two things, the beans and the sweet potatoes are in, I will have planted that entire garden. Oh, wait a minute. I almost forgot. I need to plant the sunflowers between the tomatoes. Um, I'm just amazed at how much I accomplished on my own with this garden. You know, I mean, sure, Scott did a lot of the heavy work with the mulch and the initial fertilizer. Um, he put mulch down in the walkways. Uh, to keep the weeds down in the walkways but the rest was all me everything planted in those beds I did it and I've never done that much on my own before so I'm I'm just so pleased that my diet and exercise is working wonders for me and uh, let me finish up now with the creamery there's really not much to report on the creamery this week we've been tied up with other tasks and another week has slipped by with only a little progress there uh, life on the homestead is constantly filled with meaningful fulfilling tasks um, and Scott really does have a lot on his plate right now and he, he's doing a great job juggling all his responsibilities he is so awesome let me move on now to our topic of the day, cooking on the hearth. Uh, this came about because um, I did a, a, a farm cast that was called Cooking Through the Ages. And I finished that uh, farm cast up with a recipe for cooking cornbread on the hearth. And so that brought up so many questions about hearthside cooking. So I decided to do an episode on the techniques and knowledge that our great, 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 great grandmothers used to cook meals for their families. It was all done over a fireplace or over an, an open fire or a pit outside. Uh, when the United States was founded, all cooking was done over a fire in some way. Most of, often, again, it was done in the fireplace of the home. And uh, so those, they evolved over time. They had special uh, built areas, which I'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later, and, and the tools and things that they used uh, to make that work. And they were a lot larger than the fireplaces that we have today, which are just kind of nice to look at, and they warm the house. But in the past, everything was done all the cooking was done over a fire. So you can imagine that knowledge of fire building was a part of everyday life. It wasn't just for our Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts today. Everybody knew, how all, especially the women, of course, who were doing all the cooking, uh, had to know a lot about fire building. And um, then again, as I mentioned, there were specific tools and implements that were assisted in the cooking process. So I'm going to talk about um, all of those. And uh, just to bring out a little bit more about the differences in the fireplaces, we see them today. You know, fireplace, it's charming. It's an optional feature, really, for a home. Uh, but in yesterday's world, it was absolutely an essential 
part of living. And it was also the virtual center of family life. So again, it's the primary heat source. It's a major source of light. And it provided the, the means by which all food was prepared. And uh, Scott and I have a wood stove. And perhaps you do too. And well, you know, once the match was invented, fire building in our uh, wood stove, you know, that that's no big deal. It became pretty easy. You know, we crumple up some newspaper, we lay on some wood, strike a match or use a lighter. But what the way that it was done before this great modern convenience that we have now is that coals from the previous fire had to be carefully banked at night uh, to ensure a, uh, that there was a fire ready to be built in the morning. So a cold fire meant that you had to use flint and steel to strike sparks in some extremely flammable type of tinder. And then you had a skillful application of air, carefully feeding small twigs and then larger and larger sticks into the flame. So nobody wanted to have to start uh, from a cold fire. It was just starting with the coals, the banked coals was kind of like... um, striking a match in that you already had a source of heat that you could then add fuel to that would flare back up. And and that's how it was done. It was always keeping that uh, bank coals banked in that fire. And you can imagine that in the summertime, it, it was hot. It was hot. And they, and they had to keep these fires going. So, and thank goodness for air conditioning, right? So one thing I think that is important was it was to understand how important fire safety was um, at that time in our history. So we kind of sometimes take for granted that we have these screened fireplaces, right? Um, and if you, you take that screen to, with some normal fire precaution, precautions and, you know, the hazard from sparks and coals hitting the floor, they're reduced, reduced to nothing. But in the, in the past, the fear of fire it meant constant vigilance. Uh, a coal of fire that accidentally f- w- fell on the floor and caused a fire, it was not uncommon um, in the days of these large, huge, large fireplaces. And they had steadily burning fires and there was no protective screening. In fact, health injuries were second only to childbearing as the leading cause of death in women. I think I talked about burns uh, last week and how you burn that skin off and you start losing fluid rapidly and infection. You can get infection pretty darn quickly. So certain safeguards made the difference between a pleasurable, rewarding cooking and heating experience and possible tragedy. So some things that would have been kept on hand, um, having a bucket of water nearby, um, and a woolen blanket that could smother the flames. They had long skirts and they would tuck those up and out of the way when they're working at the fire. Women were often checking the lower hem of their skirts for smoldering cloth if they dragged their dress across live coals. And have you noticed how women wore hats in the past? They, they kept their hair covered and uh, you would have seen no bare feet. When they were near that near the fire, either all of these things, uh, and we we do these thing. Well, maybe we don't wear hats to keep our hair covered, but we certainly would wa- would wear uh, shoes. Well, I guess we wouldn't really have to with our screened fireplaces. We we wouldn't have to wear shoes, but uh, those things that was standard gear back then. Uh, watch your skirts, keep your shoes on, keep your hair tied up and back uh, from that fire. So carefully, carefully thought out steps uh, guarded against accidents. You know, even the immediate area, you had to have it kept clear when you're moving hot coals. Uh, you, certainly you don't want them rolling off and catching things on fire. If they roll off, you want to, you know, scoop them up really quickly and get them back into the fireplace. And then you had these heavy iron pots that were filled with whatever simmering liquid or food and those weren't easy to handle. And so extreme care was taken in removing them from the crane, which I'll talk about later, um, or lifting them from the coals. 
and then you had frying foods and roasting meats. Those would require care to avoid burns from like splattering fat. So staying continually alert was the best protection against mishaps. So um, let's talk about the, the different steps of building a fire. I kind of went over that quickly, but uh, let's get in a little more detail. I mean, everyone has his or her own theory for the correct fire building. Um, and this is a relatively simple method. It's worked quite well for us. Uh, sometimes we start with a clean fireplace or a clean uh, stove. Um, however, old ashes actually provide insulation and it uh, helps to maintain the heat. Uh, so we, we clear ours out, but I think in the past they would have utilized that uh, free insulation of of ashes. We try to keep our ashes pretty clean. So we usually crumple up several sheets of newspaper on top of the existing ashes for kindling. In, now in the 18th century, scrap wood, bark, small and dry branches, those would be used in lieu of paper. So you have to have that layer of kindling. Okay, so next uh, what we do is we lay the wood on the kindling in a grid pattern and you're starting with soft kindling wood such as pine and then on top of the kindling we would lay a, a mixture of hardwood and softwood, slightly larger pieces and then next would follow, follow another layer of hardwood, larger pieces. And at, the, and at that point the basis is, is built. So you've got the kindling on the bottom, you've got a few sticks, uh, smaller, soft and hardwood, and then the hardwood on top of that. And then at that point, we just use a lighter. We make a flame on the end of a very small piece of pine kindling. And uh, it'll, it'll, pine kindling will uh, catch up pretty quickly. And then we just light the newspaper and get the fire started. You want to start it at the rear of the fire, uh, of the fireplace so that the, the fire starts warming the chimney and then the smoke goes up the chimney. Uh, but after the fire is well established, then we add large pieces of wood and uh, to keep the, the, the flames burning steadily. So the, all of that early stuff will break down and make some coals and that'll be enough to get your larger pieces of wood burning and then that burns down a little bit and you have larger and larger beds of uh, coals. And some of the hardwoods that we would use would be oak and hickory. Um, cedar has a tendency to pop. And in the past, that would have created a possible fire hazard. Um, so we have a door on our stove um, or the fire screens, as I mentioned earlier, you know, that you can deal with that. But no cedar in an open hearth. Uh, you can use fruit woods such as apple and cherry to provide a tantalizing aroma. Remember we talked about aroma and, and how that affects how we taste the food. And it also it puts a delicious flavor into roasting meats. So once we get the fire going, going um, well, let's, let's say actually before we get to the cooking, the fire actually has to be started well ahead of the actual cooking. Um, and, and uh, to get those coals burning. Because you, you might think that hearthside cooking is all done directly over a fire. And it's that's not true. Flames are necessary for roasting and cooking on a crane. And that's the second time I've mentioned crane. But I'll, I'll get to that in a few minutes. I'll talk about several tools. But the quality of coals is more important than the flames. Um, it, so it can take... A, at least two hours for the preparatory fire burning to burn down to those larger coals that I was talking about. You get a small bed of coals from the kindling in the small wood. So it, it's going to take a couple of hours before your larger wood burns down into a nice big pile of hot coals. Um, and so then once you have a large amount of coals, then you can rake it, you can shovel it, you can make little individual mounds onto the hearth. Um, so moving the coals around and piling them creates like cooking areas, something like the burners on your modern stove. Um, so most of your hearth cooking, baking, frying, simmering, 
all done over glowing embers, not over the open flame. Uh, so the need for a steady supply of embers uh, necessitates a continuously burning fire. So you're continuously replacing the, the embers as they burn out. Now, what kind of equipment would be used in a fireplace hearth for cooking? Um, you know, if this uh, topic of hearthside cooking is of interest to you as a hobby, there are actually tools that are available. They're still available for purchase. You have artisans that are uh, producing ironwork, pottery, woodenware, tinware, and that you can you can get those actually for pretty reasonable prices. So with a few basic implements, any fireplace can be made ready for cooking. Now your small fireplace might not work as well for some things, uh, but it certainly can be used. I'm not talking about your gas fireplaces though, am I? <laughs> anyway. Um, so here's so the following list of tools are essential for open hearth food prep. And I'm going to name them and then I'll talk about each one just briefly. So a swinging crane, remember I mentioned that, and then you have pot hangers, S hooks, a trammel, ratchets. Uh, these are all equipments that hang off of that crane. And then you have Dutch ovens and normally the the homemaker of the 18th century would have a minimum of two and they come in all different sizes. Then you would have long handled tools, spoons, ladle, meat fork, spatula. Um, then there's a thing called a trivet. You would want to have an iron pot and also you would have poker, tongs, and shovel. So let's talk about the crane. The, the swinging crane, it's a hinged device. It's bolted into the side of the fi uh, fireplace. And this was a major development as uh, kitchens evolved in the, uh, through the years. Prior to the crane, they used this lug pole. This was like a fixed device. That's a, it's suspended across the upper portion of the fireplace and it's fitted right into the brick itself. So you got this long pole, which is really what the, the crane is, but the crane swings. But the lug pole was just fixed there. And so you had to step onto the hearth. You're leaning into the fireplace to suspend or remove those heavy iron pots that are filled with food or water. So at best, this was dangerous. And the swinging crane brought new flexibility and safety since you could just swing it out and away from the fire, hang your stuff on it, and swing it back in. Now let's talk about the pot hangers. So pots were suspended from the crane, and there was a variety of, of hangers. The simplest is the S hook, and so that it's exactly what it looks like. It looks like an S, and then you can hook together. You can chain them together. And um, depending on how many you have, you're going to raise or lower the pot over the flame. And uh, so then you're regulating the amount of, of heat for cooking. Um, I actually use a version of this to raise and lower the height of the lights over my plant seedlings. Um, except I have, uh, I have a chain. Uh, and I didn't see this mentioned in the research that I was doing on this, but it certainly would have worked then where you would have an S hook hooked onto the bar, have a chain and another S hook uh, below that, that the pot handle actually hooked onto. And you could actually hook that second S hook up and down that chain to rate, to easily raise and lower rather than chaining S hook after S hook after S hook, uh, chaining those together. So there's another pot hanger um, called a trammel. That's a, basically it's a it's flat and it, um, it has a hook and eye arrangement. And it's pretty fixed. So you you're um, you put the eye over the end of the of of the crane, and then the straight metal piece comes down, and there's a hook on the end of it, and then you would hang your pot onto that. Um, that actually is a bit too long and cumbersome for any kind of modern fireplace. Um, there was another one that had a kind of ratchet where it was a similar uh, setup where you, you had this flat piece of metal, but it could be ratcheted up and down again. So you could raise and lower uh, the, the pot that you were using to get it closer to the coals or farther away. So the, the trammel, 
again, which is, is again, it's too big for your modern fireplace. But that was a really important uh, for the large fireplaces that were found in the days of colonial America. Now, let's talk about the Dutch oven. Perhaps you have a Dutch oven or maybe you've seen one. But um, some of the ones that I've seen are not quite exactly the same as the Dutch ovens that have been used in the past. Um, it was probably the single most important item for hearthside cooking because it could be used to bake bread and desserts. Um, you could use it to stew meats and vegetables or to brown foods. But what it looked like back then is it had three short legs. Now, most of your Dutch ovens, they call them Dutch ovens today. They're just round on the bottom because they sit on your stove. And it's got this uh, this domed kind of uh, lid that goes over top of it. But the old Dutch ovens, um, they stood on three legs. And you place them on the bed of coals and then whatever is in there. And then you put the lid on there. And then there are more coals that are piled on top of the lid. So the lid is actually concave on the top. It fits tightly around the sides, um, but it, it's concave. And you can put coals in there on the top. So you've got coals on the top and coals on the bottom. And so you've got a handy little oven. And then you can just replenish the coals as needed. You're scooping more underneath them, putting more coals on top. Um, and generally, you you have similar cooking times uh, to those that we have in, in our modern recipes. So it really, with this important piece of equipment from colonial days, anything that we do in a modern oven, it can be duplicated on the hearth. So think about that. If you're if you're thinking, and you can do this, of course, outside uh, over a fire as well. I know I'm talking about the inside and the hearth and all and all of that, but um, any kind of open flame fire that has coals, you can use um, a Dutch oven just just to do anything. You're baking, you're stewing, you know, you, all of that. Now you would also have a variety of long-handled tools: stirring, mixing, turning, basting, skimming, ladling. So we have all those tools as well, uh, but these would need to have long handles on them. And they'd be made of iron or wood. You would have um, spatulas, meat forks, spoons, strainers, ladles, all of these. You know, you can find these. We use these today for for our outdoor grills. Uh, so, so you could certainly find those kind of tools to be able to try this on your own. Now a trivet. A trivet... It's a, it's a tripod, and it's used to elevate pots from the coals of an open fire. And um, so in fireplace cooking, they were used to hold pots and kettles for cooking over the coals. And uh, they could also be used for keeping already prepared foods warm. So that's just, you know, just hanging it there, uh, keeping it there for a long period of time. And that's how you would use that trivet. Now, of course, you'd want to have an iron pot. And so you could hang that on the crane. That would be indispensable for soups and stews, a boiled pudding. And usually those also would have legs. Um, you could use, That pot could also be useful for simmering directly over hot coals. You wouldn't necessarily have to hang it. And then I also mentioned the tongs, the poker, the shovel. This is the same equipment that, that we use for our wood stove and you maybe for yours or your fireplace. Um, tongs, poker, and shovel, they're, they're also needed and for the same purpose as in the past. They're used to manipulate the, coal, the wood and the coals and or to shovel the ash out. Uh, let's see, how about some additional utensils? Um, just like our kitchens of today where we have all these fancy electronic things, there are lots of different hearthside tools that uh, could be added to that kitchen. Of, of that time. And there were lots of things that revolved around roasting and roasting meats. So um, there is a thing, a, a pair of andirons or fire dogs, and they're fitted with hooks to hold an iron spit. Um, so that's one uh, kind of accessory. Um, there was another kind of reflective oven that was like this big piece of tin that, um, that was like in a half moon shape and it, uh, with the in closest to you and so it, it uh, kind of it was almost like making a doorway on the on the uh, not a doorway but a, a wall and uh, so the meat would be on the other side of that and uh, it might even have a little door on it where you could uh, get in there and baste your meat 
So that was an interesting one. So you have the spits and you have these kind of uh, makeshift uh, metal barriers that make a little um, oven. Also, uh, a necessary adjunct to roasting would be a dripping pan. Those were generally made of iron and it's placed underneath the roasting meat to catch the juices. And then you're going to use those for basting or then later you're going to use those to make gravy, just like we do today. So you got to have that pan to catch them. Um, you might have uh, have had a long-handled frying pan. That's another helpful uh, utensil for open hearth cooking. So it could be set on a, a trivet or um, usually, again, made with three legs. You could stand it up over the coals and, again, frying. Of course, you're going to do it for frying or sautéing. But, again, it's got to have that long handle so you can get it in and out of the, of the um, fireplace. There also would be like a griddle for baking over the fire. Uh, that would be another useful kitchen utensil. You could bake muffins and buns and pancakes. Um, its handle is secured to the crane by a pot hanger. And then um, it, it also things that you might need um, for baking. You got pie and cake tins, tart and biscuit pans. All of those kinds of, of baking that can be done over the coals. Got to watch you don't burn the bottoms, though. So we have come a long way, baby. And it, it's still fun to use some of these traditional techniques. And they're, they're applicable on your camping trips or your backyard fire pits as well. As I, as I said, that can be kind of a fun thing that, that you uh, try out. Uh, and also... A colonial meal would be composed of foods dictated by the season and the weather. And so in a future podcast, I'm going to talk about the traditional seasonal cuisine of Virginia. But right now, let's talk about Eliza Leslie's mint sauce recipe. Um, so we have lots of lamb. Cruise on over to our website, www.peacefulheartfarm.com, and place an order. Then stop by the farm on Tuesday mornings between 10 and 12, or Saturday afternoons between 3 and 5, and pick it up. And to go with that lamb, you might want to try making this wonderful mint sauce. Now, first of all, I'm going to just read off Eliza Leslie's mint sauce recipe in its original form. All right, this is what it sounds like. Take a large bunch of fine, fresh green mint that has been washed well. Strip the leaves from the stems and mince them well. Put it into a pint bowl and mix it gradually with some of the best cider vinegar. This sauce must not be the least liquid, but as thick as horseradish sauce or thicker. Make it very sweet with the best brown sugar. Mix it well and transfer to a small tureen or a little deep dish with a spoon in it. Serve it up always with roast lamb, putting a teaspoonful on the rim of your plate. A quart or more of mint sauce made as above, but with a larger portion of sugar and vinegar, will keep very well for several weeks in a jar well corked. So don't you just love that it's like, it's a, it's a narrative for one thing. You don't get a list of ingredients. It's a narrative. And then it's just, <laughs> gradually put some of the best cider vinegar in there. Well, how much, you know, and make it very sweet with the best brown sugar. Well, how much? And so again, uh, early recipes can only be followed by the best of cooks. All right, so fortunately, here's what the recipe looks like in our modern lingo. Um, and this actually doesn't make a quart or more. This is going to make a cup, approximately a cup. So you're going to take a half a cup of cider vinegar, one tablespoon of brown sugar or more if you want it sweeter, and then a third of a cup of minced fresh mint leaves. Third of a cup of mint, half a cup of cider vinegar, a tablespoon, maybe two of brown sugar. Now on the hearth, you would combine the vinegar and brown sugar in a small pan. You would set it on a trivet over hot coals, and then you're just going to heat it until it's warm. Um, then you would remove it from the heat, add the mint leaves, 
stir well, and set aside to cool. That's it. You're going to uh, pour that sauce into a boat, serve it as an accompaniment to roast lamb. Pretty simple, huh? And um, as far as a modern technique, you're basically doing the same as hearth, uh, hearth direction number one. You're heating the vinegar and sugar, only you're going to do it on your stove over a low heat. And then you're going to com- just do the same hearth directions of number two and number three. So that's simple. It's going to be great on your roast leg of lamb. I hope you enjoyed this week's traditional hearth cooking topic. Um, The mint sauce recipe is available free for download at www.peacefulheartfarm.com forward slash category slash recipes. You will find all of my other recipes there as well. And again, don't forget to pop over to the online form store to make your lamb purchase to go with that mint sauce. Speaking of lambs, we've been extremely blessed this season with those nine healthy lambs. And I just have to say that again, it doesn't always happen that way. And we are so grateful. Remember to get on the list for purchasing a quarter half or a whole beeves uh, as those come up. And as we get ramped up for our herd share program with our brand new cow that's giving that A2, A2 milk, we're going to be busier than ever here. But we are never too busy to listen to your input. Stop by the website. Leave us your feedback. We'd love to hear your ideas. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hop over to Apple Podcasts, give it a five-star rating and a review. Also, please share it with any friends or family who might be interested in this type of content. As always, I'm here to help you taste the traditional touch. Thank you so much for stopping by the homestead. And until next time, may God fill your life with grace and peace.